to convey some apologies because Ms. Shackelford did go on for quite a while, but I think it was very important that she, as someone who is from this town, have an opportunity, because it very rarely happens, I think, that someone from West Haven uh, or Prospect Avenue, Oak Ridge Gardens, what it was called, uh, gets an opportunity to speak and be heard and, 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 and to be honored and, and, and in such a respectful manner be heard as this, uh, as this group has allowed. Thank you. Um, but there are a few things that John Key says I do have some time to say. He thinks it's also very important that we go into a question and answer session. Uh, and it was more appropriate for Ms. Shackelford to, to speak longer and more in depth because she is Charlottesville. Uh, sh this ground produced her, and it's appropriate for her to come back and talk to her family. Yeah. Charlottesville is her family. When I, when I was a student here at the University of Virginia, and I'm an outsider, uh, one of the things that one of my mentors, a, a, a man named William Elwood, told me was that in a town that's relatively small, you might be able to do something. Uh, I was trying, I was toying with the idea of whether or not I should leave and where I should go from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the likelihood in his mind of me being able to change New York or Chicago or even Richmond or Norfolk was not as strong as being able to do something in a, in a small town. I, I wanted to say a little bit about who I am in terms of my background because I think it's very important. And then I'll try to synopsize some of the things that, that I would have said, and I think that'll be sufficient. Uh, I was raised by a mother, did not know my father. Her philosophy on life was be safe, be careful, take your time, take it easy. Uh, I wound up running into, and I think it's important to mention race with regard to various things because it is still important in society. I had a Jewish counselor who said, go to University of Virginia. Why don't you apply there? I said, I never thought never occurred to me. I was going to go to Virginia State or Hampton or Morgan State uh, University College, Morgan State College at the time, I believe it was. Uh, I saw white males in suits in a brochure, an old brochure in the counseling office, and wondered what in the world <laughs> was he thinking <laughs> to, to make that recommendation. Uh, I got off the bus. It was a trailway station at the time. By the time I was, it was, it was 1971, and it was the fall, and I got off that bus, and according to my upbringing, the thing that I was supposed to do was to take care of business. I got off the bus. There was a yellow cab sitting out front, or I think it's maybe some other uh, brand name cabs. I would get in the cab, shut my mouth. I didn't know the stranger who was driving me. Uh, take me up to the university, get in those dorms, go to class, come back home for the holidays, and get your degree. <laughs> that, that was her philosophy. Uh, and that's what I followed for a couple of years, as a matter of fact. But one time when I got off that bus, and many times I'd seen the store across the street, or I couldn't make out what it was exactly. I, it, it was strange. I, I saw Vinegar Hill Theater on one side of this vision, you know, that I can only glance at because I'm not supposed to linger too long in places that I'm unsure about. I, I saw Vinegar Hill Theater. I saw this place that looked kind of weird. I, I couldn't see through it very clearly. I didn't know what was inside. But by now, I'm a junior. So I'm, I'm thinking, be bold. <laughs> go, go, go in. See. Uh, I walk in. It's very dark. I see something like candy, two for a penny. Um, other things, I can't even see what it is. It's so dark in there. And, and then I look around, and I see a man and a woman standing behind the counter saying, hello, how are you doing? And I'm, I don't know, I'm saying, who are you? And I, I, didn't, I said that to myself. And, and uh, they held a conversation with me. And they talked about life in general. And I'm, I'm saying, well, I couldn't see this from the outside, but I'm going in, and there's the kindest individual, some of the kindest people I'd ever met. What took me so long? And I was actually seeing the last days of Inge's grocery store that you can read the history about in, in that book. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of mesmerized when I come out, but I do come back out, get in the cab, and, and, and go on my way back up to the university. But I'm, I'm wondering, who, who are they? You know, they're just uh, this couple that is standing behind the counter. What, what kind of store has two couple, a couple standing behind the counter waiting to serve just this one customer, the whole store? No other customers. How do they survive? How does the, how is the business still going on? I'm, I'm wondering all these sorts of things, and then I'm going about my business back up at the university. Um, I had never read, really, a black history book before. Never read a novel. I was in the transition program at the University of Virginia where I was told, you're not good enough to go to the University of Virginia, but if you go through this program, 
that'll bring you up to snuff. Uh, William Elwood was the director of this program, and it was the first time I'd ever read a book by a black author. I don't, I don't know my history. I don't know the very history that spawned me. And I'm, I'm reading Richard Wright's Native Son and the autobiography of Malcolm X and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and, and other works of black literature that had never been exposed to in my black elementary school or my integrated junior and senior high schools. I come to University of Virginia and I learn about col this word colonialism. Didn't know that Africa had been colonized. No one has been teaching me all of this. No one has been telling me about what life is like for a black boy growing up in the ghetto of Chicago. No one's sharing this information. I wonder why. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. A lot of different reasons. Uh, and there's still are no women authors, by the way. This is 1971, 72, 73. But that's a whole nother talk that I won't <laughs> get into. Um, I'm still asking myself this question, who, who were they? I know I, I, there's a big empty field there. Now, Vinegar Hill Theater sounds like an attractive name for a theater. That's, that's about the most I can make of it as far as what does Vinegar Hill mean. Uh, Alexander Scott, in an interview in the book, says, any person or groups of persons who labor over a generation or generations and develop whatever they can develop by the sweat of their own brow may not be able to build castles, but I have a feeling that whatever they build and whatever they take care of and whatever they own is on the plus side for any person or for any group of persons or for any neighborhood. Some of these people who lived in Vinegar Hill and worked on two jobs and three jobs at a low cost Ben did the very best they could. And you can't say that that person was shiftless. He's living in an economy that he just couldn't work out. 30, 40 years ago, and he's talking about 1980, 30, 40 years ago, 1930s, 1940s, about the only employment black people had was domestic work. And domestics have always been poor, particularly when it was done primarily by blacks. I'm at University of Virginia now. I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on this. I'm trying to figure out what my own history is. Uh, and I'm thinking about who these people are standing in Indy's grocery store. Who are these people that Alexander Scott is talking about? And my experience is different from Ms. Shackelford's. I'm reflecting on the 50 and 60 year old black women, old women, who are walking through the dormitories Kit House and the other dormitories at University of Virginia cleaning up behind the students. Sometimes and we could be quite nasty, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, when we threw up on Fridays and Saturday nights in the bathrooms. I'm, but, but I don't know them. I just see them coming to clean up and then leaving, but having such respect for these students, including myself, as a matter of fact. Um, fraternity cooks I, I, I encounter from time to time. The worker at the bus station who unloads, as I recall, and I could be wrong about this, a white person sells the tickets, a black person loads and unloads the suitcases from the luggage compartment in the buses. This is, this is who, I'm, I'm watching this. I'm getting a, trying to get a sense of who I am. Um, I'm, I'm noticing that uh, when I go to the barber shop, and it took me two years to go to the black barber shop in Charlottesville because mom said go to the dorm, study, don't get in trouble. <laughs> and I'm, this is sad to say, but Getting into trouble meant going on the other side of the tracks. Stay on the side of the tracks. And we literally have a track that runs through dividing the haves from the have-nots to a large extent. University of Virginia from poor people. I, I do venture out to a barbershop. It's a black barbershop by the time I'm a junior. And I'm not talking too much, just like in the taxi cab. Uh, don't, don't talk to strangers. I'm sitting there, cut my hair. That's, all, that's, what, that's what you're here to do. I'm here to get my hair cut. I'll pay you when you finish, and I'll go on my way. But this, this barber is forcing a conversation, as uncomfortable as I am. And then eventually, I, I think we only say about three things during the whole haircut to each other. And one thing he, uh, he finally says to me is, you from Upton University? And, and, and the way, it sounds kind of humorous, though, but then I'm going to wear some sadness in that, too. Here's a man, 40 years old, I'm 19 years old, and he's respecting me. Who are these people, and who am I, as a matter of fact, in this, in this whole scenario? I used to go to Memorial Gymnasium. This is the, my account is, again, slightly different from Ms. Shackelford's. I go to Memorial Gymnasium because we could have our intramural games there. If, just if you had some spare time after classes, you could go there. 
That's one of the places I felt safe. It was on the university. What, uh, I, I would run into people there, black males, who would come there, and I would notice that one, uh, I think, delivered flowers. One was a janitor. Uh, and when I finally sat down and had a conversation, we played basketball with each other. I finally had a conversation with him and said, I said, I said, where, where, are you, where do you work at? And he said, Bozy. I said, what? Bozy. Uh, and I'll get back to that. Uh, this man who's a young man actually in his early 20s. But this young man and the flower shop delivery boy and the janitor would come in and regularly beat University of Virginia's varsity basketball team. <laughs> and not only did they beat them, but they would say, what I'm going to do to beat you, how I'm going to go, what shot I'm going to take, and how long the game is going to last. And they would say this, and they would do it, and University of Virginia's varsity basketball team could not stop them. Every now and then, they would let me hold the ball and pass it to them. I just stay out of the way, stand over there on the side. We'll let you play with us, but just pass the ball to us, and we'll do the shooting. Uh, who were they? What, what kind of town has basketball players who can stand under the basket at five foot seven and a half without even hardly bending their knees and dunk a basketball backwards and not be on the team? And over and over and over again, you see this sort of thing. Uh, just throw the ball down. One player to have his back turned, just throw the ball down, not even really aiming it, and knowing that one of his players is going to get the ball and score on University of Virginia's basketball team. I'm sitting down after this game and saying, who are you? <laughs> Bozen. What? what? Bozen. And I finally find out after listening many, many times, very wise gentleman, as a matter of fact, too, this young black man, talk about philosophy, life in general. I would wager to say much smarter than me. Uh, for his years. And I find out that what boys it means is boys head in. And he's not, he's not going to get any more specific than that. So I'm left to assume that he's working a menial job at boys head in instead of playing in the NBA. Instead of somebody in high school developing him, telling him, or his parents, or somebody, or his church, somebody saying, you have talent. If you stay in your room and study, graduate from high school, you can go to the NBA. And this is countless numbers of individuals, I'm not exaggerating, that I've actually seen that can go and play basketball at some Division I college who for some reason or another, or another are not even getting out of high school. These are the people that, that I'm not all that familiar with that are part of my history that I'm learning about as I study Vinegar Hill and reflect back on, on my own years at University of Virginia. I, I, even as I'm working on this book, reflecting back on my history in general, when blacks were slaves, because Alexander St Scott goes further on to say that, uh, that these individuals had not completely liberated themselves. We had some of the leftovers from a much earlier age, even back to slavery. So I'm reflecting back on slavery. I'm thinking about Thomas Jefferson. I'm thinking there's a book uh, by Francis E.W. Harper called Iola Leroy where even though it's against the law for interracial marriage to occur, Roy Thomas Jefferson, interesting things occurred. There's a stereotype there was, and that is that it's a white man in the back in the field. Ah, that's all I had to work with. History is concerned. Educated than that. You look at the hill, and I, and, I, and I imagine you had all of that. You had someone that you got to wonder, where did their wealth come from? So suddenly, right after slavery, you had some who must have, as I'm imagining, worked in the fields. You had light skin. You had dark skin. You had some so light that you would have said they were white if they didn't insist that they were black. And, and had some wealth. Could a white man tell his black child and tell the society around, I'm giving you all this, and I want the world to know that I'm giving you all this, and I want you to get out there and do the best you can with your life? Or is that something to be swept under the rug that only a very few can ever find out, and it will just sort of disappear on with history. But it's down on Vinegar Hill. And also on Vinegar Hill are those individuals who had to do the menial labor during slave, slavery of, of all sorts, all, all in a community.
This is that community that uh, we've been talking about uh, so many times. I, I, as I'm skipping through some of the things that I, I'd like to share with you, uh, I did want to say, as far as this community is concerned, that what struck me an awful lot was how safe it was. Even though there was rowdiness, even though there were what must have been something like bars that existed there and individuals got drunk, I, I don't get the sense that they were killing each other. Uh, I don't get the sense that women were on a regular basis like they are today at dark, uh, disrespected. Uh, black women said, breaking your house never happened. Nobody, nobody ever tried to rob me, never. They were poor. Talk about innately immoral. <laughs> they were poor, but they never thought of it. They never thought to rob somebody. Any night, you could walk all over town and walk back. Women alone didn't make any difference because wasn't nobody going to bother you? And what about in looking at this community again? What about education, which is so important? Of course, there is slavery was against the law as far as the southern states were concerned. What's really interesting is that immediately after slavery, these schools sprung up. So that's an ambiguity, too, because what was the... How can so quickly schools spring up in a society that had insisted on a race staying illiterate? What kinds of schools are these? Uh, and before I get too critical, I've got to, I got to urge that there has to be some sort of bridge. But one wonders whether or not there were some who were interested in providing a bridge through education, or whether some were interested in using the educational process to just continue to hold blacks down. Only industrial types of, of uh, education. And in 1926, an industrial high school curriculum was added to Jefferson. In 1951, Burley High School started. Then in 1958, Charlottesville began its, began its integration process, uh, developing a community by the sweat of its brow, as Alexander Scott indicated. Meanwhile, and, and this is something that's very close to my heart, uh, just like I'm sure you, you, love, you love Prospect, and you love a certain element of Charlottesville. Someone was telling me, um, that um, was asking me, well, where do you want to go work? Where, you, know, you know, this university is this, this university is that, talking about different schools around the country. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, University of Virginia is a pretty good school. And I said, in my mind, University of Virginia is the only school. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it just is an indication of, of the fondness that, that I developed with regard to University of Virginia. And maybe, maybe that's a flaw in my character to some extent. I don't know. But, uh, you, you, you can become quite attached to your alma mater with, uh, with, with its flaws and, and, its, uh, and, its, uh, and its great things. I, I, um, and I don't want to uh, just talk one individual because I went to a council meeting uh, earlier uh, this morning and there were quite a few individuals in there and they're great people regardless of race, and, and that you probably would not even be aware of how great they were because they're just about the business of doing uh, God's work. But what, what made me so happy as someone who used to live on the lawn at University of Virginia and someone who was a counselor at University of Virginia and got involved in a lot of things, what makes me so happy is to see someone like John Keese. When you know who's involved, his picture's been in the paper and I get a sense and he lives in prospect, something that I would have been terribly afraid to do. But when you got a situation where you have someone who's so cowardly who will go out and start beating on a woman in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning and then run off. It's, a, it's one of those cowardly sorts of things that I can imagine. And sometimes you have to be careful because when anger sets in, I know a whole race can be judged by that act. I, th I think about something like the Ku Klux Klan. And they would not love nothing better than for blacks to believe that all whites were like them. The bully coward that struck Daisy uh, Lundy, I think her name was, would love nothing better than to produce the kind of division that you, Ms. Shackleford was talking about, the chaos that makes us more intent on fighting each other than to realize that there has been an awful lot done by very brave people of all races, and this one idiot would like for us to be forgetting all of that as we focus on him now, sitting up somewhere probably enjoying himself, but probably the coward that he is, probably terribly afraid that his day is going to, knowing that if the law doesn't get him one day, God surely will. So he's probably hunkered down, worried at this particular point. Um, when, when I was at the University of Virginia, uh, and this is in 
the, the 1971, I had to sort of reflect back on, on the, the, the process whereby blacks got to the University of Virginia. Um, Walter Ridley graduated from University of Virginia in 1953, a black man. Brown v. Board of Education was decided in 1954. Uh, again, I'm reflecting back to the many conversations that I, that I had with uh, Elwood, William Elwood. And what he conveyed to me was that Colgate Darden was actually slowly, slyly integrating the University of Virginia. He had to because he would have faced too much opposition if he had just come out. Sort of like the, 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 the battle, I guess, that ensued between Bear Bryant and George Wallace down in Alabama, where Bear Bryant thought that George Wallace was crazy, but he couldn't come out and say it. He was in favor of, to some extent, integration. But again, in that environment, he couldn't come out and say it. So you had this one person, and maybe even others that people weren't aware of, going to the University of Virginia uh, during that time. By the 1950s and 60s, there are a few dozen blacks at the University of Virginia. Uh, when I was there in 1971, I will say that I talked to a student who was one year ahead of me, and he talked about having an egg thrown at him from a window, uh, presumably by, by a white person. Uh, again, it made me think, wow, you, I guess my mom was right that I should make sure that I, I'm careful. Um, uh, I remember uh, myself being hit by a snowball as I was, I was walking along and someone, it was a couple of white males who threw a snowball, an icy snowball, and it hit me right in the face and my eyeglasses went one way and, and I was sort of halfway knocked to the ground and I, and I, could, I looked up and I could, barely, I could barely see through the window. I left my glasses there and I was a slow to anger person. I left my glasses there and I ran up, it was on the second floor of a building, and I think I wanted to kill, I wanted to beat the tar out of it. That, that icy snowball stung. I didn't even know what I was doing. I wasn't afraid at that moment. I just wanted vengeance, blind vengeance is, is what I was after at that particular point. But I think that uh, I'm glad they weren't there because by that time they'd, they'd, they'd gone. Uh, with regard to Daisy Lundy, I, I'm hopeful that she's going to continue to run to be the first black woman a president of the Student Council of the University of Virginia. I think that's very important. I think that I think she will have won the battle. Even if she doesn't win, if she stays in the race, I think she will have won the battle and become part, if maybe not to the extent of other martyrs, but she's become, she will have become very, very important in the development of the kinds of questions and issues that are important to Charlottesville and the University of, of Virginia. Uh, so so I'm, I'm very hopeful that she will continue in what she must be a very special person, able to bridge racial divides and many other things. And it's very important that she stay out there and succeed so that the coward will see, and other cowards like that will stay in, the, in, in, in their place, so to speak. I'm, I'm told to tie this up rather quickly, so. <laughs> I also wanted to just emphasize that in terms of voting in 1960, we, I don't need to give you the names, uh, Cheney, Goodman, Swan, I don't even need to go into details that, that uh, a black person and those who try to encourage blacks to vote could be killed. The impression that I'm getting is that if a, person, a black person went to uh, the ballot box to vote in Charlottesville, they would not be killed. But at the same time, Maya Angelou has these things that she calls the little murders. Uh, how, how you are treated, uh, if you're disrespected in your daily life, you think you're going to be disrespected if you go down to the ballot box. Uh, just how people talk to you, who's going to be there, uh, might make you not inclined to, to even vote. You may say, why should I do that? Why should I put myself through that? Uh, it's, it's, not, it's just not worth it. And then finally, I, I, I think I also want to emphasize that uh, it, when we talk about the issue of Vinegar Hill, I think we need to talk about poverty in general in America. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I reflect on, at Purdue University, someone gave a talk on how, how the Jews became white. When did the Jews become white? Well, sometime after World War II, and they were trying to pinpoint the exact date. I, I, but I, it was very interesting, it was very fascinating that someone could even contemplate that that's what was going on as far as what the Jews had gone through and where they are now. Uh, same thing with Italians. Um, one time it was, you know, put the big, dark, overly sexed Italian in the ring with another Italian and let's watch them kill each other. Uh, and that'll be our entertainment. And, and as the Italians came in, to, in up in New York, uh, into the slums of New York City uh, and had to be put through that, they found a way to survive and, and eventually could become white. 
Um, same with the Irish. Uh, the colony of England is the way some people perceive it. Not even worth saving while they're starving to death. Um, uh, not even worth saving, as a matter of fact, even as they have some of the same culture of, of, of England, but nevertheless, at a certain point, were able to become not black Irish or other types of Irish relegated to certain jobs in society, but they were able to become white. I wonder with regard to Latinos, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to be able to be white? Is becoming white the thing that's going to save you? And then when it comes down to blacks, I, I really ponder we're not going to be able to be white. <laughs> so that avenue for equality doesn't exist, and, I, and I'm ending up pondering with regard to individuals, particularly in Charlottesville, but also in other places, what really is the solution? Uh, John said, Kai said, Keith, what, what exactly, get, just say whether or not you think there's some hope. And uh, I, only, I was sitting at this in a query to a large extent because I, I had to say to myself, I don't, I don't know what I can do that. But I'm pondering as well, and I reflect also back on what Elwood's words were, in a small community, you might be able to do something. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.